国主奇妙的耶稣
我们奉主耶稣基督的名开始今天早晨的敬拜，弟兄姊妹，无论你在哪里，都欢迎你加入我们一起，加入天上永不停息的敬拜。让我们先读一段的圣经，一二三，请。我又看见且听见，宝座与活物并长老的周围有许多天使的声音。他们的数目有千千万万，大声说：“曾被杀的羔羊是配得权柄、丰富、智慧、能力、尊贵、荣耀、颂赞的。”亲爱的弟兄姊妹，这位曾被杀的羔羊现在已经复活了，让我们加入天上的敬拜，听啊，天上万众同唱。降生、受死、复活、升天的圣羔羊耶稣基督，如今在天上还为我们代求。接下来这一首，在高过诸天宝座前，这首歌的歌词，事实上十九世纪就写好了，原名《代求者》。一百三十四年之后，有姐妹重新编曲，老歌新唱。引导我们对天上的大祭司发出敬拜和称颂。我们请敬拜团先唱第一次。Oh. 
救主，我们的神。今天早晨，我们非常荣幸，有三一的系统神学研究教授范浩沙博士 （Van Hooser） 在我们当中。他著作非常的多，涉及的领域包括了神学、释经学以及文化各个领域。今天早晨，他的题目是“十字架的智慧，神学为何重要？神学”。为何重要？我把时间交给范博士。Xi Chong Jie Mei Pinong, grace to you from our God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a great joy and privilege for me to speak at this Gospel for China conference. Though I speak in English and come from California. We are part of the one family of God, thanks to the cross of Christ. The organizers of the conference have asked me to do two things at once: to preach about the cross and to say why the church needs theology. By theology, I mean faith thinking, disciplined reflection about God, God's word, God's works, and the realities the Bible speaks of. I love both the Bible and theology, so for me, this is a double happiness. My theme is the way of the cross, doctrine for discipleship, and I'll begin by preaching on First Corinthians chapter one, verses eighteen through twenty-five, where Paul describes the cross as the wisdom of God. Then I'll speak about the ministry of theology and how it contributes to Christian wisdom. Now I was raised on the West Coast in California, so I suppose that makes me a Western theologian. But please don't hold that against me. I'm a Western theologian who cares more about the gospel 
than I do about being Western or American. I've served as a missionary in France, and I appreciate the challenge of communicating cross-culturally. I taught in Scotland for eight years, and though they spoke English there, or something like it, the Scottish accent is very heavy, I was definitely a foreigner in Scotland. And my students from Trinity come from all over the world. I've lectured in Europe, Australia, and South America, so I may be from the West, but my theology is not Western. Because a large part of my responsibility as a theologian is to make sure that my Western culture does not take Christianity captive, so that we worship a Christ made in the culture's image. A theologian must always be alert to the danger of idolatry, even if the idol in question is wrapped in the American flag. We need pastors and lay people everywhere who know the scriptures and Christian doctrine. Why? Well, answering that question is my task for today and tomorrow. I may bring some strange things to your ears, as Paul did to the Athenians, according to Acts 17, verse 20. But I hope that, like them, you'll want to know what these things mean and why they matter. Well, we live in challenging times. People are searching for fulfillment and happiness, and there are many outside the church who claim to know the way to the good life. Invest your money this way. Exercise this way, buy these products, follow this philosophy, listen to this music. The French philosopher Blaise Pascal said, all men seek happiness, and I think he's right. It's even written into the United States Declaration of Independence, which describes the pursuit of happiness as a fundamental human right. The problem is, we're surrounded by people proclaiming different gospels, each offering, often for a price, a different strategy for attaining happiness. There are competing strategies and competing stories for achieving the good life, and it's particularly confusing for younger generations who are exposed to so many possible ways of living. We're consumers in a global marketplace and what's being sold are formulas for the good life. Be this, do that, give your life to my cause. Just this year, a book was published with the title Ars Vitae, The Art of Living, which was the Roman philosopher Cicero's definition of philosophy, the art of living. And the author of this new book says that people today are confused because we live in a self-help, consumerist culture that makes the self's desires the most important thing, and yet it is unable to satisfy the self's desires. And the author of this book is struck by the return of the ancient arts of living in American culture. He sees signs of neo-Gnosticism, neo-Stoicism, neo-Epicureanism, all those old philosophies that the Greeks knew. But what's striking is that these are all ways of wisdom that were around at the time of the New Testament, ways well known to the Apostle Paul. Well, let's call a supposed path to the good life a way of wisdom. Some ways of wisdom are ancient. If I understand correctly, the Tao is a way of wisdom, an understanding that's not simply theoretical, but meant to be lived. Well, the term philosophy, so loved in the West, means the love of wisdom. And in both East and West, philosophy was considered a way of life, an art of living, according to the ideal of wisdom. Today then, as in Paul's time, the church finds itself in the middle of a wisdom contest in which various ways of life are competing for our allegiance and devotion and for the hearts and minds of our children.
and the prize being held out is success, human flourishing, living a full and happy life. So nothing is more important than finding this way of wisdom. And what's at stake is a matter of life and death, or rather, the good life or death. Whose vision will we follow? You see, we're all following some plan, some vision, some way. We're all disciples of somebody's wisdom. So how shall we live? Whose words are we following? If you drive a car here in America, you're no doubt familiar with the traffic sign that says wrong way in bright red. And sometimes the sign includes the warning, do not enter. Wouldn't it be nice if wrong way signs appeared in our lives before we made wrong choices that lead to terrible mistakes? Yes, it would be nice, but if we always relied on such signs, we would never become mature Christians who could make decisions for ourselves. Paul exhorts us in Romans 12, too, to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. And if we do that, he says, you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. Jesus claimed that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And the earliest Christians are described in the book of Acts as followers of the way. Now, in order to follow Jesus rightly, I think we have to understand who God is, who Jesus is, what God has done in Jesus, and what he asks us to do in Jesus' name today. A.W. Tozer says that what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And the task of theology is to help people have the right idea about, about God. And this lies at the heart of the church's mission, to reflect on and to celebrate and to respond to God's word. But the challenge is, many people do not have the right idea of God. The sociologist Christian Smith interviewed hundreds of church-going American teenagers when he was doing research for his book, Soul Searching. Many of these teenagers were religious, but they couldn't articulate their faith. What they did say they believed amounted to a less than biblical theology, and Christian Smith names it in his book, Moral Therapeutic Deism. And according to this theology, God wants people to be nice to one another, moral. He wants them to feel good about themselves, so this is theology, this is a kind of doctrine, but it does not correspond to the God who had to become man and die on a cross for us. And that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 25. You see, Paul also was engaged in a wisdom contest with the philosophers of his day. Ancient Corinth was a prosperous city if prosperity is measured in population and wealth. It was a busy urban center, and the city valued trade and the pursuit of success. Social status, your standing in the eyes of society, mattered greatly to the Corinthians. A New Testament scholar named Ben Witherington says, Corinth was a city where public boasting and self-promotion had become an art form. The Corinthian people thus lived with an honor-shame cultural orientation, where public recognition was sometimes more important than facts. Does that sound familiar? Ancient Corinth resembled many urban cultures of our time, and as with big cities, there was often corruption. The Greek playwright Aristophanes coined a term, korintha'izo, to act like a Corinthian, and he used this term to describe wild sexual behavior. Corinth was also home to religious pluralism, 
By the Apostle Paul's time, there were 26 sacred places devoted to different gods in Corinth. The New Testament scholar Anthony Thistleton sees parallels between ancient Corinth and the postmodern culture of the West. And he's thinking particularly of the Corinthian pragmatism, pluralism, and desire for social status and preference for captivating storytelling, also called spin, rather than plain truth. Gordon Fee, another New Testament commentator, says, Paul's Corinth was at once the New York, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas of the ancient world. So for all these reasons, I hope you can see how this 2,000-year-old epistle has particular relevance for us in our urban centers today. There's also evidence that the church in Corinth was in many ways a mirror of the city. Paul's epistle shows us just how concerned he was to correct Corinthian Christians. You see, the problem is they were like living, they were living like citizens of Corinth, not like citizens of the gospel. For example, there was competition and boasting among church leaders over whose way of wisdom to follow. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.12. Well, Paul wrote his epistle in order to deal with divisions that threatened to tear the church apart. He had heard, you see, that there was quarreling in the church, perhaps about which leader's wisdom was the most impressive. In the Greco-Roman world, rhetorical eloquence was highly valued. Powerful orators received the same sort of acclaim and public adulation that is today lavished on movie stars and sports heroes. But not Paul. Paul's opponents looked down on him. He was not a professional speaker, and he wasn't interested in marketing his message so that it would impress his hearers. The fact that he was a lowly tent maker may have contributed to some in the church treating him as a person of low social status. You see, for the Corinthians, high social standing, that was the mark of success. You are a success if you have these status symbols, wealth, fame, power. Not much has changed, has it? We still tend to think that people with higher social status are more successful. And this was Paul's challenge. How do you preach the gospel to a people who are status-hungry, who desire the status symbols of the rich and famous, who want thousands and thousands of Facebook friends and who desire above all to be liked and their tweets to be liked. But Paul's challenge was the same as Jesus, how to preach the coming kingdom of God to people who were experiencing a kingdom and expecting a kingdom to come in power and glory. They were expecting the kingdom to come by the sword not by lowly words. Well, Jesus taught about the kingdom with parables, and his stories turn normal ways of thinking upside down. And Paul does something similar here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, because the cross turns worldly expectations upside down. Let's look then at verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Did you know that most of what Paul says about wisdom, he says right here in 1 Corinthians? The word wisdom appears about 26 times in the first three chapters alone. And Paul introduces his favorite theme here, the message of the cross of Christ, the gospel. And did you notice that the contrast, the contrast Paul draws here is not folly versus wisdom, 
or power versus weakness. It's rather folly versus power. Paul does identify Christ with the wisdom of God later in the passage, but in this verse, he's criticizing the Corinthian tendency to put too much stock in human wisdom, the wisdom of the world. Like the kingdom that came with Jesus, the cross contradicted human expectations. And so Paul is contrasting here foolishness and power. You see, foolishness, like the idols, is helpless. It can't do anything. Foolishness is vain and powerless. It doesn't lead to flourishing. But power makes a difference. And the gospel Paul preaches is that the cross is powerful because it makes all the difference in the world. It sets things right with God. Of course, to those who don't believe Paul's gospel, the idea that a crucifixion makes us right with God and establishes God's kingdom is just plain silly. The cross does nothing for those who are perishing. But to those who have faith, the cross is the power of God unto salvation. The cross isn't an idea. The cross is an event. It's the fulfillment of God's promise to send the Messiah, the Savior of the world, to set things right. It's what God is doing to make us right with him. Paul goes on in verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the, discern, the, discerning, the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Now, Paul, in this passage, is citing a verse from Isaiah where God says he will do wonderful things to confound the world's wisdom. The cross is that wonderful thing. It's the wonderful exchange where God takes our penalty upon himself and gives us the status of children of God that was rightfully his sons. As the popular saying goes, no one saw this coming. You see, the cross crosses out human philosophies, schools of wisdom that leave God out of the picture. No human experts were expecting anything like Jesus' crucifixion. God has proved wrong all human predictions and prognostications. The cross is a judgment on human reasoning, and that's how it makes the wisdom of the world foolish. But also here in verse 21, Paul speaks of a good wisdom, the wisdom of God. And he's referring to God's plan of salvation, which is altogether different from worldly thinking. People wrongly think that the way to salvation is by accumulating things, by getting more knowledge and wealth, power, fame, and so on. But none of those things leads to real human flourishing. The real human flourishing is simply life with God. And Jesus explains how we get there. He says, truly, truly, I say unto you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And this was God's plan, to take on death so that we might live. And not only that, but preaching too is part of God's plan. We gain true wisdom, not by going to school and getting degrees, but by going to church and hearing the proclamation of the gospel. The gospel is the only way we learn about what God is doing in the world through his Son and Spirit to put things right. Verse 22, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, neither Jews nor Greeks could make sense of the cross. 
the Jews were looking for a conquering Messiah. They wanted a sign, an impressive display of God's power, something to write home about. The Greeks wanted knowledge, intellectual truth, but what they get from the cross is the opposite. They get weakness and foolishness. Remember what the cross was. It was an instrument of capital punishment. It was like being hanged or, or put to death on the electric chair. Nothing to boast about. Nothing more shameful than this kind of death. How could that express the wisdom of God? But nevertheless, despite the appearance of the cross, Paul insists that to those on the way to salvation, the crucified Christ is the power and wisdom of God. The cross is the wisdom of God because it is the power of God to salvation. That is, it's the means by which God has dealt definitively with sin. It's the means by which God has conquered the evil powers and principalities. There was indeed power in the cross. You know, when Jesus was speaking about his death to his disciples, he spoke of the departure that he was going to make in Jerusalem. And the term he used for departure, his death on the cross, the term he used was exodus. It's the same term that Israel was familiar with because it's the same term that they associated with the great saving event of the Old Testament, the exodus from the bondage of Egypt. That was what made God their deliverer. And similarly on the cross, Jesus' exodus from life, God again brings his people out of captivity, but this time from captivity to sin and death. And that's why Paul can say in verse 25, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So he's here summing up his argument with a paradoxical statement. By speaking of foolishness, Paul's not suggesting God is stupid. On the contrary, the so-called foolishness of God is what God has done in Jesus Christ. It only seems foolish to human beings because it contradicts their idea about greatness. Any God involved in something as scandalous as the cross must be weak, they thought. But this is Paul's point. The Corinthians are captive to a mistaken idea of what it means for God to be great. Humans, in their prideful wisdom, think they know God and can find a way to him, that they can make themselves sufficiently righteous before him. But the foolishness of God, gospel truth, is that God has found a way to us a wholly unexpected way. I don't think Paul is attacking reason as such, as if our minds were the problem. I think the problem is pride, the assumption that through our reasoning alone, we can find out the things of God. Paul doesn't object to reason when it's used to receive revelation, when it's used to understand his epistles. No problem there. The only question is, which is to be the servant and which is to be the master? Well, I've suggested that there are parallels between ancient Corinth and our 21st century global context. In part, that's because people still stubbornly refuse to know God the right way. They think that they can know better than God. Note that everybody is a theologian if they have an idea about God, about whether or not he exists, and if he exists, what he's like. So even people who say we can't know anything about God, they claim to know at least one thing about God, namely that he's unknowable. So everybody is a theologian. We all have ideas about God. Are we approaching him the right way? The great Protestant reformer Martin Luther faced a problem similar to that of the Apostle Paul, which is perhaps why he used this same passage, 1 Corinthians 1, 
to develop in his treatise, uh, Heidelberg Disputation, a famous contrast between the theology of the cross and the theology of glory. You see, there are two ways to be a theologian. One way, the way of glory, relies on worldly wisdom, reason, to find out God. And it relies on our own ability, our morality, to make ourselves right with God. That's what Luther is calling the theology of glory. It, it's the way the world does theology. But the other way, the way of the cross, says that we know God only because God has made himself known through revelation, and that we can be right with God only because God has made us right with himself through the cross. So Luther criticized the idea that was popular in his own day that we can know God apart from his revelation and that we can make ourselves right before God through our own good works. You see, that's religion. That's religion, the idea that we can do something in and of ourselves to earn God's favor. Religion is worldly wisdom, this prideful assumption that God will reward us if we try hard enough, if we do glorious works. But Luther taught that the gospel concerns not what we do for God, but what God has done for us. God's grace is a free gift. It's not something we merit. And so this is why Luther, centuries after Paul, is doing something similar. He's contrasting the theology of glory, the wisdom of the world, and its grandiose assumption that we can make ourselves holy with the theology of the cross. Luther says, it's certain that man must utterly despair of his own ability before he is prepared to receive the grace of Christ. The cross of Christ, which for Luther is a shorthand for the whole story of Jesus, the cross of Christ is the refutation of human religion. The true theologian, says Luther, the one who knows the God of grace and himself as unworthy, the true theologian must be a theologian of the cross. That's why Luther adopted the saying, the cross alone is our theology. So we've seen 1 Corinthians 1, Paul's contrast between the wisdom of the world and the foolishness of the cross. We've seen Luther's distinction between the theology of the cross and the theology of glory. Let's now move forward four more centuries to 19th century Denmark and another Lutheran, Soren Kierkegaard, and a similar contrast. Again, Paul's contrast between two kinds of wisdom is restated by Kierkegaard in an 1847 essay that talks about the difference between a genius and an apostle. What Paul called the wisdom of the wise, and Luther called theology of glory, Kierkegaard calls genius. The Greek philosopher Socrates was a genius. For the genius, truth is universal. It's available to everyone who's clever enough to discover it through reason. The genius is a thinker who can discover the truth faster than the rest of us. The genius is to the way of worldly wisdom the way the hare is to the tortoise. The world rewards genius. Think about Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. And society recognizes geniuses with Nobel Prizes and book contracts. You see, the genius enjoys high status because the intellect is valued by all. I think ancient Corinth would have showered all its glory and honor upon the genius. But Kierkegaard, who is himself a philosopher and a very smart man, Kierkegaard contrasts the genius and the apostle like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle is simply one who is sent. That's what the word Apostle means, one sent. A person commissioned to embark on a mission. 
And this is precisely what happened to the Apostle Paul. He met the risen Christ. And from that moment on, instead of doing everything he could to persecute the church, he did everything he could to build up the church. Kierkegaard points out that what authority an apostle has depends on the one who sent him with a message. You see, no one sends a genius on a mission. The authority of a genius is simply a function of their own thinking. But the word of the cross that Paul speaks was not something a genius could discover. It was something he had to be told and then commissioned to pass on to others. So what Paul learned about the cross from the risen Christ, he proclaims and passes on to others. He's an apostle. He's one sent with a message. He knows his message is foolish by worldly standards. He's not a genius. He doesn't defend it with philosophical arguments, but simply by testifying to it, by his own experience of the power of the cross in his own life. Paul says, even if an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Galatians 1.8. Paul says that not because he's boasting in his own genius, but because he claims the authority of an apostle. He's speaking with the authority of the one who sent him, the risen Christ. And what Paul knows, he knows not because he's intelligent, but because he was told. He was told by the crucified one himself. As he says in Galatians 1, verse 2, For I did not receive it, the gospel, from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, apostolic truth is foolishness in the eyes of genius, but it's the wisdom and power of God. So Kierkegaard's essay on the difference between a genius and an apostle summarizes what I've been calling this competition between wisdoms. We could even call it the war of wisdoms, the struggle between the wisdom of the worldly wise, what the Corinthian geniuses thought they knew about God, and the wisdom of the cross, what Paul the Apostle knew because Christ told him. I hope that you're seeing how Christian theology begins with Paul's contrast of worldly wisdom and the wisdom of the cross. This is why we need theology, because there is a war of wisdoms in our world. We need good theology because there's bad theology. Bad theology, like the theology of worldly glory, imagines that it can know God simply by thinking about something like a perfect being or by projecting what we think a perfect being must be like, or what we want God to be like. The point is, bad theology begins with man, with human desires and human thoughts. And interestingly enough, that's the same place idolatry begins. But the theology of the cross, by way of contrast, approaches God by trusting the revelation that comes from the testimony of the prophets and the apostles. It trusts a word that came from God. This is why the cross of Christ turns the wisdom of Greeks, Romans, Americans, and even Chinese upside down. Every culture has an intimation of God, but no culture foretold the cross. C.S. Lewis reminds us that God is not a tame lion. He has his own plans and his own ways, and he does things in his own way and his own time. And so if we would know God, we have to pay attention to what he has said and shown about himself. And the cross is the place where God stoops and shows. The cross is the revelation of his wisdom and power.
The cross is also the foundation of Christian identity. The preaching of the cross, you see, opens up the way Christians should live in the world. It provides a new framework for interpreting everything that we thought we knew about God, the world, and ourselves. But best of all, the preaching of the cross is a God-appointed means of transformative power. It brings us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Let me now address the question assigned by me by the organizers of the conference. Why does the church need theology? The short answer is to answer the call of wisdom that we hear in Proverbs 8. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? Whoever finds wisdom finds life. And that's why we need theology, to make sure that we're setting disciples on the way towards wisdom, the wisdom of the cross. We need theology because Christians today, like Christians in the past, are contestants in this battle between different kinds of wisdom, the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of Christ. Remember, everybody is a disciple of someone. The only question is, who are we following? Whose words are we following? What way of life are we following? We're all disciples. There is a distinctly Christian way to walk in the world, and that's why theology exists, to make sure that that way is clear. But do we really need theology? Isn't it enough simply to read and preach the Bible? Not always. The questions people ask are often complex, and we don't serve our congregations well by giving simplistic answers that will not satisfy them. Do you remember the uh, story of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8? He was on his way to worship in Jerusalem, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit sent Philip to his chariot, and Philip asked him, Do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch replied, How can I unless someone guide me? Exactly. Philip is the personification of the theologian. Like Philip, you see, theology's task is to minister understanding by helping people to understand what they're reading when they read the Bible. You see, people today, as in every generation, need someone to guide their understanding of God and the gospel. Just last week, I was surprised to see a commercial on a major television news network. The commercial was about 90 seconds long, featured Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham. It must have been expensive, because as I said, it was about 90 seconds long. So how did he use the time? Well, he began by mentioning COVID-19, and then he spoke of God's love, and then he invited people to confess their sins and invite Jesus into their hearts as their Lord and Savior, and then to phone the number on the screen. However, he did not mention Jesus' death on the cross. He did not explain what sin was or why it's so terrible. And so I wondered whether people would invite Jesus into their hearts and if they did, with what kind of understanding would they do so? I'm afraid that if the Ethiopian eunuch had been watching this television advertisement, he wouldn't have understood what he heard. It was not the full gospel, and there was no Philip there to explain what Franklin Graham was saying. You see, the church needs theology to help people today understand this ancient an urgent message, because it's not self-evident how a death by crucifixion can be the salvation of the world. It falls to pastors and theologians to explain the story of the Bible in ways that people can understand. The biblical text is authoritative, but at the same time, 
We need to know something about the context we live in in order to explain the message. Simply repeating the biblical text without making the effort to explain what it means in our context, that's a ministry of repetition, but not a ministry of understanding. And I'm sorry to say, but I think that's what was missing in Franklin Graham's commercial. Now, what is doctrine? Doctrine simply means teaching, and theology is teaching about God. Christian doctrine teaches Christians what they should believe about God. The task of theology is also to distinguish true teaching about God from false teaching. And when it teaches the truth, it teaches the truth not simply for the sake of theory, but for the sake of making disciples. Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 11, that the risen Christ has given the church evangelists, pastors, and teachers to build up the saints. And Paul mentions doctrine, the Greek term is didaskalia, Paul mentions doctrine 15 times in the pastoral epistles. That's interesting, because doctrine performs pastoral functions. Doctrine corrects error, deepens understanding, fosters wisdom, and encourages godliness. I'll say more about the purpose of doctrine in a moment, but here I want to just say a little bit more about what Paul means by calling doctrine sound, sound doctrine. The Greek term he uses is related to our term hygiene or hygienic. It has to do with health. And Paul is saying that doctrine is good medicine for the body of Christ, the church. And I think this is an appropriate image because the English word doctor, physician, comes from the same Latin root from which we get the word doctrine. Doctor, doctrine. It all comes from doctrina, which means teaching. So think of the theologian as a doctor or physician of the church the person partly responsible for the health of the body of Christ. And doctrine is a way of keeping the church spiritually fit and disease-free. Doctrine is sound, health-giving, when it accords with the gospel and all the scriptures. But remember, there is false teaching, and false teaching is poisonous to the body of Christ. So a theologian is a doctrine of the church who administers health-giving doses of doctrine to the body of Christ, thereby ministering understanding. Like medical doctors, theologians have to diagnose disease as well. That is false teaching, false ways of wisdom, anything that sickens the body. So there's a negative ministry and a positive ministry of theology. And now we come to what doctrine does. Sometimes people think doctrine divides. And it does. Credo-Baptists from Pado-Baptists, Lutheran from Reformed, Episcopalians from Congregationalists, and so on and so on. And that's one reason why some people want nothing to do with doctrine. It divides. But in my opinion, the only dividing doctrine ought to be doing is the dividing between true and false religion. If Christians do divide over doctrine, and they have, it's not necessarily doctrine's fault. It's usually the fault of Christians who either don't know how to disagree charitably, or they've exaggerated the importance of a non-essential doctrine. The way of wisdom here is to remember the ancient advice. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. The main point I want to make as I begin to conclude this first talk, though, is that sound doctrine is necessary for discipleship. You see, doctrine isn't simply for academics. As I've said, we're all theologians, amateur theologians, in the best sense of 
meaning people who do theology for the love of it, an amateur. Doctrine is necessary for the life and health of the church. It's necessary for building up the body of Christ until it attains maturity in Christ. In other words, doctrine is practical. It makes a practical difference. And that's why I've been focused on wisdom, because wisdom is the right use of knowledge for the sake of living rightly in the world. Did you hear? Theology is something to be lived. John Calvin was a pastor who preached, wrote commentaries, and he wrote theology, one of the best books ever written, The Institutes of Christian Religion. And here's how that theology book begins. Calvin writes, Nearly all the wisdom we possess consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and ourselves. So taking my cue from Calvin, remembering that theology is a way of wisdom, let me now suggest five ways in which doctrine increases our wisdom. First, as I was saying about Philip, doctrine helps us read the Bible with understanding. And by the way, that is the purpose for which Calvin wrote his Institutes. Not to serve as a replacement or a substitute for the Bible, but rather to serve as a means for helping people read the Bible rightly. He wrote it especially for pastors, helping them to read the Bible with understanding. So the Institutes provide an organized presentation of doctrine, a summary of what the Bible is about. And Calvin hoped that his work would enable people to read the Bible without stumbling over certain parts. For example, doctrine helps us answer questions about the story of what God has done. The doctrine of atonement, for example, answers the question, why did Jesus have to die? Many readers stumble over that part of the story. Why did Jesus have to die? The doctrine of the atonement is the answer. Secondly, doctrine identifies God as the Father of Jesus Christ, helps us understand what God is like and what God is doing, and helps us to distinguish the one true God from all the false gods out there. As we learned from 1 Corinthians, we obtain right teaching about God, not from human speculation, but from listening carefully to the prophets and apostles. We know God because God has spoken and acted. And we do theology to make sure that what we say about God corresponds to the way God has spoken and acted. But third, doctrine contributes to our knowledge of ourselves, to self-understanding. It, it addresses the big questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What's wrong with me? Where am I going? And it does answer those questions by speaking of human beings as the image of God and as sinners and as people of faith called to new life in Christ. You see, today, many people are struggling with the question of identity. Who am I? But for Christians, the most important thing to know about identity is not our sex or our ethnicity. It's rather the fact that we are beings in Christ. This is how we must understand ourselves theologically as ones whose lives are hidden with Christ in God, as Paul says in Colossians 3. So doctrine tells us what God is like. It tells us what we're here for. It also tells us what the church is and what the church is for. And if we don't know what the church is and what the church is for, we won't be able to be and do the church correctly. So doctrine helps Christians understand the church as set apart for the sake of worshiping God, making disciples, and serving the world. Doctrine teaches Christians and the church everything they need to know in order to be faithful representatives of Jesus' way. And then finally, doctrine specifies the way of Christian wisdom and helps disciples walk in that way. 
I hope you're getting the idea that theology does everything a worldview does and more. It gives us the big picture that should orient our everyday living. It explains why there is something rather than nothing. It explains why I'm here and what I should do with my life. Sound doctrine provides a map for walking the way of wisdom. We're wise when our lives are conformed to that of Christ. And that's also why Paul said, be imitators of me. He was a man in Christ. He was a man who had the mind of Christ. So this is why Paul could say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Galatians 2, 20. So these five reasons for valuing doctrine are all aspects of the most important reason, and I'll conclude with this. The church should value and teach doctrine because it helps the church fulfill the Great Commission and make disciples. Men and women and children who understand the story of Jesus and who can demonstrate their understanding by the way they themselves live. Jesus commissioned the church to preach the gospel and make disciples. And this is one of the most important things the church can be doing. But we can't make disciples, we can't teach people how to follow Jesus if we don't understand the way. And as we've seen, his way, the cross, confounds human wisdom. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus in the 21st century? What does that look like? Well, theology helps us understand the story so well that it can become our story. We want to be more than hearers of the story. We want to be doers of the story. And if we truly understand the story, we can be doers. That is, we can participate in that story. So doctrine builds up the body of Christ by helping people to grow in their understanding of God, the gospel, and themselves. We don't want to be like the Corinthians because Paul called them infants in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.1 Infants in Christ who need to be fed with milk, not solid food. But Christian doctrine, that's solid food for growing up mature Christians. The author of Hebrews uses the same expression. He says, solid food is for the mature. Hebrews 5.14. Solid food, doctrine, is for those who've been trained to discern good from evil sound from unsound teaching. It's all about making disciples. Paul tells Timothy, train yourself for godliness. 1 Timothy 4, 7. Train yourself for godliness. Knowing God serves this practical purpose, training for godliness. Because we can only become godly if we know what God is like, what he's done in Christ and so on. These are the things that doctrine teaches. So the right way to teach doctrine is the way that cultivates godliness. As Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 3, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. And that thought from 1 Timothy brings us back to Corinthians, because the Corinthians were puffed up with the wrong kind of knowledge. They associated godliness with greatness, not with the way of the cross. You see, true discipleship requires a desire to conform to the way of Jesus, not to your own way. Our puny human wisdom won't get us very far. But the way of Christian wisdom, the way of sound theology, measures everything we say and do by the person and work of Jesus. And that's the way to go. My final point then is that when we do theology rightly, it will be edifying. It will build up the church. 
Sound doctrine is good for us. It's not simply a duty or a burden. It's good for us because it teaches us to live in accordance with reality. You can't be wise by living in ways that conflict with the way things are. You can't be wise by living contrary to the created order or to the new created order in Christ. And so doctrine helps disciples achieve wisdom by becoming the kind of people who love the truth and understand reality and can say and do things that correspond to the way things are in Jesus Christ. Doctrine matters because it enables Christians to live in harmony with God, the created order, and with one another. And this is how doctrine edifies the church, by training disciples who know how to follow Jesus with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Doctrine teaches us to play our parts to the glory of God in God's story, which is about making things new in Christ. So brothers and sisters, this is the wisdom of the cross, and it's the privilege and responsibility of theology to be its servant and ministering angel. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wenhuzer's